For all of you who listen to Submersion and own an Android device, go to the Google Play Store and download the Podcast Republic app. It's a fantastic app that allows you to get all of your favorite podcasts directly on your Android device. I personally use the app and I love it. I can search for the podcast I want to listen to, select it as a favorite, and have it just a click away. Make sure you select Submersion as a favorite so you don't miss any of our new episodes every Thursday. Again, the app is the Podcast Republic app, available on Android devices. Episode 97. Woo! Gotta bring that energy up. That sounded a little lackadaisical. Me or you? You. My woo was my woo was powerful. You were like episode ninety seven. Eh, that's what it kind of sounded like. Uh, Yeah, I know, I know. I thought Brown was going to come up with something, but he didn't. He's sitting there quiet. Uh, I'll say it's been a while. I feel like since we've done this trio. It's true. I think there was there was a stretch where we were kind of the the regular three for a while, but then. Zach came back with a vengeance, and we've even peppered in a little bit of Alex and Patrick there. Yeah, I feel like we've all been, it's been a an eclectic group, a large group. Sometimes we've gotten all five, and this time, a lean, slim, slender, how many more words can I use? <clears throat> uh, uh, spelt. Um, <laughs> uh, three hosts. I think I ran out. I will, I will say, um, Zach, Alex, and I took to a separate chat room. To, you, you to, be moan, to be moan that you guys went forward with Beer Fest without us. Um, well, I think we're all pretty big Beer Fest fans and had no yeah. idea that that was taking place. So in response to that, Zach, Alex, and I will be working on a Beer Fest macro pod. Oh, wow. It's a big pod. Um, <laughs> uh, call it Beer Fest Revisited, if you will. Um, there's, I think there's a lot more room to uh, inject some insights to that movie and uh i would say expect a four-hour episode with as many as six guests that's a great i wow. mean it's great i think you're looking forward to do it do you think you could get up to 10 because you're saying six guests three hosts now you're only at nine can you get that magic 10 get those double ditch or what do you think um i don't know i, I don't want to get tropesy with it i don't think we always need to have a, a nice round clean number mm. uh maybe we make nine the new thing you never know i will say my family uh, descends from German boot makers. And I wasn't even on the beer fest episode. So need, needs to be done. Needs to be I, done. Yeah. I can see, I can see why you were upset. Thank you, Jamie. At least you see my point. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, congratulations hurt. though, by the way, Kyle on that, uh, what was it? A two seventeen bowling game. 2-11. 211. 211. And no one even gave a shit because he lost his game. So Yeah, yep. I got listen, destroyed. I and you gotta bring that up again. Great man. What the heck? It's all right. Uh just just letting you know. That was a decent episode, but <laughs> just wait till the, great, just wait till right? the just wait yeah, just wait till the macro pod comes out. Well, I'm excited for it. All right. I'm working on the soundboard. Hold on. <laughs> uh, Jamie, uh, are you going to be yeah. one of the, the people playing this uh, Animal Crossing? I'm, I'm getting blasted with uh, messages here. Looks like I've got like five or six friends playing this. And uh, to me, it, it, not to insult it or call it a children's game, but uh, I'm pretty shocked. <laughs> what began as an innocent conversation among friends would soon spiral out of control and later be referred to by future generations as the eighth wonder of the modern world. Mac East Studios takes you on the journey of your lifetime as your captains, Alex the Mustard Man, the artist formerly known as Brahm, Jamie the Ointment, Kyle El Capitan, and Zach the Backbone present Submersion. Sorry, Brom. I had to cut you off there. You were about to badmouth Animal Crossing. <laughs> we don't lose this potential sponsor. Oh, that's okay. true. Not a sponsor yet. Um, but I will say I was a player of the original Animal Crossing, first Animal Crossing that ever came out. I was right on that. Second one, I think, came out on DS or something. And I was right on that one, too. Uh, but since that, I've kind of fallen off. I don't know. How many Animal Crossings are there? How many games have they come I out think with? I, had, uh, I think I had Wild World. Is that one, Kyle? Yeah, see, that's one I didn't have. That is think. one. Is that the DS one? 
I think so. Okay. So there was GameCube one. Yeah, that's the first one I had. That's why I had DS that one. one. There's a Wii one. I see. I don't think I. I don't think I had the Wii. 3DS in 2012. Yeah, I know. And then that was the last like major game release for it. But all right. Well, I hope you guys enjoy it. I don't think I'll be partaking, but honestly, (laughs) I've got like six people in that group chat. I'm like, holy shit, maybe I I I need to, you know, fit in here and get it. Just do it. Uh, I I'm very well may. All right. Well, this is not Animal Crossing podcast yet. It's still a submarine film podcast. And Brom, yes. what do what we watch this week? Well, it, this is a submarine podcast. And I will say for avid submarine fanatics and submarine movie fanatics, we got back to some classic submarine action this week oh, yeah? in the form of Netflix's The Wolf's Call, a French film. Oh, that's not we the did, title. It's we, The Wolf's we, Call. It is a French film. The right. Wolf's yes. Call. The Wolf's Call, French call colon, a French film. A French film. film, right, okay. I right. like that. That'd be a heck of a title for a movie. <laughs> so for the next set of movies, we are doing anything that came out in 2019, and we've got three for sure. Yeah. We're really trying to get our hands on this Belgium film called Torpedo or U-235. If you've got a line on it, Email us at mackeystudios at gmail.com. So that sounds like, it sounds like we're in the pre-order phase, right? For that movie? Yeah, it looks like it's not even out on uh, DVD yet. Well, it's done, yeah, out, it, it is out on DVD. Japan. Yeah, it was out on DVD okay. in a couple countries, just not in countries. That but we don't we want to risk getting because, coronavirus. For sure. We do not. Can you imagine? That's how it <laughs> yeah, they'd affects say. us. We get it on a, on a DVD <laughs> from a Belgian film from Japan. It's like the C. The head of the CDC is like announcing how, like, okay, we've tracked it back to the original source, Patient Zero, <laughs> Kyle, who uh, ordered this Belgian film, the epicenter of the epidemic. And then submersion explodes, and yeah, everybody like, loves okay, it. And we've like, we've oh heard gosh. CDC though, we heard it's about this podcast submersion. Then all of a sudden, President Trump's talking about submersion. Like, okay, let's we can badmouth Kyle all we want, but let's not badmouth this this podcast because I've listened to it. it's very good. We're like, right. President That's, Trump, my God. We didn't do anything illegal. So, I mean, it's it's all good publicity. Right. It is. It is. And you it's can't great. catch it. I might it. lose can't, my can't. life, but it is what it is. <laughs> two, two percent chance. And I am willing to take that risk. I, I, I'd say so. All right. Let's get into this thing. So, it Shall stars, we? if you're into French multimedia, maybe you know these people. For many of our audience, you may not. But I will probably, per usual, pronounce some of these names incorrectly. Francois Civil as Chanterade or Sox. Nice. Omar Sy as Dorsey. Omar Sy, do you know what movie he was just in? No. Call of the Wild. Just saw it in theaters. Was he? Yeah. He's one of the, he's like the first owner or what once they're up in the Arctic, uh, first owner of a, uh, the dog definitely really? recognized him. Definitely, yeah. Recognized he's been him. in a whole bunch of movies. He's he's a very he's a, a working actor. We'll say for sure. Matthew Kasovitz as Alfost, Rita Kateb. I'm really butchering these. I've got to be as a name that I thought I didn't even think was actually a name, but Grand Champ, Grand Champ, Grand Champ, and Paula Beer is Diane or Prairie. Diane. Ah. I've got her as Prairie in my notes. Prairie? Yeah, she said that was her uh, American, or that was her uh, name that they thought when when they moved to France, that that was a common French name. Prairie. Prairie. That's funny, too, because Alphonse Alphonse is not a name. Alphonse is like a title, right? Alphonse? I have no idea. Alphonse, it said, like, uh, reporting to the Admiral and Commander of the Strategic Oceanic Force, codename Alphonse. Huh. Yeah. Don't know. Yeah, it must be a title then. Yeah. Uh, Jan Yves Bertolut, he looked really familiar. Was he a uh, actor we would know from something else? He was not in Call of the Wild. I can definitely say that. Uh, looking him up, it so looks no, like he does have he does have a Hollywood resume. He was in The Da Vinci Code, mm-hmm. Hereafter. Um, yeah, looked very familiar. He played the uh, the ball-busting captain. 
like, and that's a different term over there. He's like not the captain of the sub, but that's like the head of the Navy. Mm. Gotcha. All right. Shall we get into it? This was a Netflix film. We all enjoyed it streaming at our fingertips. Um, did, and this thing opens up with a pretty powerful quote. What was the quote? The man himself, Aristotle. Mm. Human beings come in three kinds, the living, the dead, and those who go to sea. Ah, uh, I mean, in the Submariner. We're like, Aristotle, what? How did you yeah, even know about that? Know? Um, Time travel. So we open and we're focusing on the French submarine, Titan, Le Titone. Uh, titanium, it says. I don't know, whatever. Um, it's near Syria uh, where it's they're trying to recover like a, a mission, a group of special forces who are doing some kind of mission. We don't actually get a, a very clear picture of exactly what they're doing. They, they clearly have set up some kind of base there. They go into some tunnels. They're, they're doing a bunch of stuff. And their point is they're going to do the mission. These special forces are going to come swim out and then the submarine's supposed to pick them up. As this is kind of occurring, they get a contact and Sox, who is supposed to be kind of a genius, almost like a superhero at a certain point, but like he's like the top... Um, so in our guy, he's got golden ears, uh, and basically, uh, he can recognize all kinds of stuff, knows exactly what it is. And he basically says there's like this special, um, what was it? Uh, Persian, uh, or Iranian, um, uh, boat that's sitting there who has everything going on. It's got like crazy, um, sonar technology. It's got crazy weapons. It's got all this stuff. They can't be seen by it or they are Dunzo. So, and that's a surface ship. Yeah, it's a surface ship. So they, they start to be really careful. Like, oh, can we still do it? They're not really sure if they can definitely 100% evade this, but they go into evasion. Everyone gets quiet, you know, try to evade, but we, they still want to pick up these special forces. All of a sudden- and Some of the stuff here that's really cool that we're seeing how good Sox actually is, is he identifies that frigate based on the number of the blades yeah. on the propeller- he says, okay, based, you know, sitting there doing some kind of whatever, calculation, yeah. you know, it's going at this speed. It's got to be this ship. Yeah, it's a special ship. And it, this is actually where the name The Wolf's Call comes from because they have a special technology on the surf ship that basically um, will make a, a certain noise. It's, a, it's the ping. And if they get pinged, they'll be found and then they're pretty much done. So that's, that's what The Wolf's Call is. It's kind of interesting they named the movie The Wolf's Call based on this very early part because that boat doesn't play like a huge role in the whole grand scheme. Cause what really does play a role in the grand scheme is the next thing they get another contact, but they have no idea what it is. He's getting a very faint noise. And he's like, wait, four propellers. That's weird. Like it's, it's got four. Uh, that's not even something that's really in the books. They, they basically, he's trying to say, could it be this? Could it be that? Could it be a whale? They have no idea. Cause basically it does not fit the characteristics of anything that is considered active. That would be, and it's really faint. Yeah, and it would be old. I like, guess the thing, like nothing would have four. It's not like it'd be like, oh, this is a new submarine we don't know about. Like, it seems like it doesn't fit any criteria to make any sense for what they have any intelligence on at this point. And so he's like, um, they're like, we need to know if it's a submarine. If it's a submarine, we we really are screwed, and we need to get out of here. We need to abandon the mission. Tell us, tell us, tell us. And eventually, he makes the call. Never mind. No, it's a it's a whale. That's all it is. Everybody, well, everybody is really pressuring him. Yeah. I mean, this is a pretty intense scene, and everybody's like, yeah. "Dude, you've got to know what that is." Yeah, and so then the special forces are swimming out, and they turn out they're they're wrong because it becomes clear that whatever that contact is, it's communicating their or, or helping the frigate locate them, and in the end, the the frigate is able to find them as a result of this other contact, and. Uh, they start. They send a helicopter out there. All kinds of things are going. So they're basically. It seems like they're going to be dead in the water at this point. They're going to be um, depth charge to shit. A helicopter comes over and depth charges them. They're barely surviving. Have we seen that yet in a what, submarine uh, movie? A helicopter uh, based depth charging attack? No, I don't run? think because so. the, the the thing is is I think what we're seeing for the first time is a modern a modern depth charging, which we just don't see very often because I'm not sure we've seen many modern movies about submarines that isn't more about like a mutiny mm -hmm. or something going on on the submarine itself yeah. and like the, the whatever the conflict is is far away from the submarine and they're just tr trying to figure out what to do about it um in terms of launching a missile or something i think this is the first time where we've seen a modern depth charge uh-huh right it felt it really felt new i've never seen like anything that like in, that yeah we didn't have anything like that in hunter killer did we i don't believe so 
Because again, hunter killer, they were going somewhere where a conflict was occurring. They were kind of evading some things as they tried to go from one spot to another spot. But I don't think we really had. I don't think we had depth charge. There was missiles being launched and stuff, but not the depth charge themselves. I may be mm-hmm. wrong. Right. We, we may have seen it in one of the movies. But anyways, good question, Brom. Great question. Uh, I give you a, a golden star. It's a new awesome. thing. Awesome. Let me. Where do I? Where should I record that on my character sheet? Yeah, just put it on a put on a sheet. You have one. Everyone else has zero. Just to be clear. Okay. Yep. Uh, and so they're basically done. Like the, the helicopter is going to come. They're going to find them, going to shoot them. And so they really have only one, re- one recourse because they're, they're staying put. They get the special forces in and now they got to do something about this helicopter. And the captain's like, uh, give me a gun. And they're like, what gun? Like the only gun that's going to take out a effing submarine. All right. And they're like, we can't do that captain. And then he's like, he starts to unzip it there, his pants. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, you're right. You're the captain. So they, he puts Omar Sai in, in command for a second, grabs his gun, goes up to the top and uh it's an rpg it's an rpg it is and basically he gets up there and he's looking at this uh helicopter or whatever and um the thing is locked basically he didn't have the key like you need a couple you need a key to like unlock the rpg and um he doesn't have anything to do that so they kind of like bunker down first i hunker down for a second the helicopter comes around and starts coming back at them and he's like bro to his like the person who's with him, you got to do something about this. And basically holds up the RPG as the guy uses a gun to shoot off the lock. And this looks kind of silly because it seemed yeah. insane. Uh, but and like he didn't even like like he like he was holding it in front of him. Like he didn't even he didn't hold it. Yeah, you should away from your body or something. <laughs> right, yeah, or set it somewhere and yeah. then shoot it. Not yeah. like hold it at face level. All right, shoot at me, bro. And this is it doesn't this, work like that. This scene was actually the source of something that I told Kyle at bowling, and I'll get to it when I get to the final uh, review. But it's really silly looking and, and kind of strange in a movie that otherwise seems very well made and, and professional. This one seemed almost like you'd, something you'd see in like a current day uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme film or something. Uh, yeah. And so then he shoots down the submarine and everyone, I mean, obviously they're whoa, happy. Whoa, 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 whoa. Sorry, it's not. He shoots down the helicopter. RPGs the shit out of that helicopter. And then they're saved, right? Yeah, they yeah. slip away. And now everybody gets back home. And as all sonar techs do, our sonar tech socks is obsessed with trying to figure out what he heard. Yeah. And so he's trying to figure it all out. Um, he has no idea. He's going through everything that he has available. So he has like access to the whole database, obviously, for the of the French in terms of this kind of sonar technology. He can't find anything. So he goes and goes to his boss and is like, yo, boss man, I couldn't find anything. And the boss man's like, you've done fucked up, man. Like that was clearly a drone. We used Fourier transforms. Ever heard of it? It's called math to figure that all out. And you are dumb and couldn't do it. So how about you just get out of here and also your access has been revoked from the rest of the stuff or whatever. And this is where we start to see maybe a little bit of a superhuman type ability of socks, that golden ear that they've talked about a little bit so far. He stands outside his boss's office while he logs back into a computer and he sits there and listens to the keys that he's typing in mm. so he can remember which order they're in to enter in a password. Yeah. Very James Bond esque. Yeah. It also helps that the password was not very good. <laughs> well, that is true. Yeah. But he, uh, the other thing that happens at this point is he's trying to like pick up, he, he picks up a book on Fourier Transforms. It's kind of funny because Fourier Transforms is like, it's not like it's like new math. It's not like crazy. Like, I mean, anyone who's works in like sound stuff or, electrical engineering and that kind of stuff is going to work a lot with Fourier transforms. I had to learn it since I was an engineer uh, in college. So it's not like it's a crazy new thing, but he's sitting there being like, Ooh, interesting Fourier transforms. That's strange. I'm like, okay, I, I used to have to do that for like homework. Um, oh, wow. Well, yeah, he, goes, so he goes to a bookstore and gets this book runs into, yeah, he could Wikipedia that shit. It's a very common he could, thing. He could so, don't need a book, but Netflix. All right. So Netflix is big on, books they've got this other right? show called you with like a stalkerish type guy that's right yeah, yeah. love yeah and he is huge into books oh okay so they, they, okay so netflix equals books i'll remember that yeah and so they want you to quit watching netflix and start reading books it's not making sense interesting business it. strategy um 
Anyways, he falls in love with this librarian, and they bone almost immediately. She's like too, it's totally into him as well. And also, they, yeah. sm- they smoke then, like weed together, which is kind of a big deal later on in the in the movie. I, it's just a very subtle thing for in the scene, and then it does play a pretty big role in this movie. Jamie, did yes. you put on your glasses during this scene, though? Oh, I did. I, I put on my glasses hard, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the then, listeners uh, at home will know what we're talking about. Oh yeah. Uh, and then he, so that he uses the password and stuff like that to get, he, he's able to get into like, uh, a library. He realizes basically, uh, that they have another archive that he could look in, kind of an older thing. He's like, oh, wait a second. Maybe I don't even need to use this Fourier transforms or try to like prove it wrong. I will just go and look in the older archive where they've kept all this stuff. So he goes to this library. He still has, he uses the password, kind of able to get through into there. And he finds the pattern that he's looking for. Basically, it's an old Russian submarine that was considered destroyed or decommissioned and then scrapped. And so it was taken off the books. It, it shouldn't exist anymore, basically. And his, you know, commander or captain or whatever comes in is like, you've done fucked up twice now. You're basically out of here. They lock him in the room to not let him out. They're going to straight up arrest this yeah, guy. Yeah, he's going to arrest him. They come back and he's like, no, you got to listen to me like – I know what it is. It's a submarine. It's not in the books. That's why we didn't know about it. But someone has this submarine or the Russians have brought it out out of secrecy. Like basically that's what at first they're thinking because Russia Russia's being super aggressive right now. They just invaded Finland, all this stuff. It's somewhere in the near future is where we're set. So like they're being super aggressive. Yeah. What was and the this, name of it? What the, the where Timor they- Timor 3. The Timor, oh, the, the, yeah. Uh, the Russian terror was what it was called. Yeah. And so ah. I guess it's a Russian R-30 nuclear- Miss, oh, sorry, that's a different one. Yeah, it's a Russian Timor three ballistic missile submarine, it's supposedly dismantled, and um, so they they just think Russia hid this away for a time when they would need it and to do something tricky, and now they've brought it out and that they were messing that with them in Syria, presumably as like a test or something like that, but now that it's going to be used for other purposes and stuff, and so. Now the, the captain's intrigued, and so they're going to send out – they're going to use the captain of the Titan. They're going to propose uh, – or not propose him, to promote him to be uh, captain of the formidable – formidable uh, – and nuclear submarine. And then Omar Sy, he's going to become the captain of the Titan. And they're going to go out on a mission and basically try to make sure and, and keep Russia at bay as there's all this aggression uh, going on. And to keep in mind, Timor 3 uh, might be out there. And so – as a result, the captain who relied on Sox and knows the talent that he has is like, Sox, you're on the, the submarine. And so we're thinking, obviously, we're in, the rest of this movie is Sox kind of like saving the day on the uh, uh, formi- was, uh, formidable. And that's that. Lo and behold, he shows up to be on the nuclear submarine because he passes all the tests like crazy. He even knows when like a submarine's gotten stealth and stuff. He can find it, even though it's supposed to be oh, and entirely knows- silent. I mean, he knows other things, too, because there was two subs that were completely identical, and they said, how do you know that this sub is this sub? And he said, that one has had its props remachined. Yeah. It's newer. Like, the props are newer. Yep. Yeah, Yeah, because it got into combat. Got it. And so, we think, okay, he's going to be doing this. It's actually relevant, though, because they were were quizzing him on the two – the two subs that they're going to send out, the Titan and the Formidable, which are the French subs that they're going to be sending out. One's going to be Captain by D'Orsi and one's going to be Captain by Grand Champ. And yeah. he was able to delineate between the two despite them being identical. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it was exactly those two because the Titan, I don't think the Titan was a, uh, a big nuclear submarine. But I, whatever. He's basically able to – he even said like it's – that's the Formidable but it's going silent and they're like, uh, bullshit – there's no way you can hear that because the formidable was, you know, silent. It's actually legitimately silent. And he's like, okay. But he's kind of proving to them that he can l- literally hear what no other people can hear. And, but he shows up and they're like, uh, pff, your drug test came back <laughs> negative, bro. So, uh, have fun token yeah. it on land because you're not getting on and the summer. And from this point on, we should just refer to him as the stoner. Yeah, so the stoner is all upset. He throws his shit in the ocean like a dope. Because come on, keep your shit. It's your stuff. And But like <laughs> things start going crazy even while he's there. Like they go out on the mission. The submarines are out there. He's seeing them. A tear's rolling down his eye. He's like, fuck you guys. And um, But as he's coming back to town, kind of lamenting uh, all the stuff, he 
the, like alarms start going off and clearly a missile is being launched and he runs at the last moment to get into like a special base, even though he shouldn't really even be there, but like he kind of like sneaks his way in. And so he's standing there and he hears that basically uh, a, a ballistic missile has been launched from uh, Vladivostok or somewhere around there over in the Bering Sea. Mm -hmm. And it's going across Russia and it's going to land in France. And they basically have to determine whether they're going to do a response or not, right? Like it's supposed to be mutual destruction or whatever. So do they launch the nuclear missiles in response to this nuclear missile heading to Russia? And so they're like, we need to figure out whether this was even launched by Russia or not. Like we can't we 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 can't do a response if it's just some rando person uh doing it and so they're like do we have anyone they're like no and someone kind of points over and is like actually golden ear over there the stoner aka yeah uh he's he can do it and they're like shit and he he looks at him and he takes a long drag through his, like, yeah i would say through his bloodshot eyes dude i'll, I'll figure it out yeah so he sits, <laughs> he sits down and he's listening and he they're like well what what was it is it and he's like i've heard uh, you know yes this is it was launched and that was the tomor 3 the one that i just identified it is a russian submarine so it, it must be from russia and they're like shit okay let's get everything going you know let's send the order to uh grand champ whatever and have him go through the process of uh launching a missile which is irrevocable like once they send it it's done. So as they're doing it, they send them the thing off. They they get the the orders and they're like, shit. Okay, we I guess we got to launch this missile, even though everyone is, you know, justifiably worried about this. Obviously, if you're in a submarine, you're going to launch a nuclear missile. It's a pretty intense situation. So they're like, they're on edge. And meanwhile, something that like kind of was funny to me, and maybe there's some kind of navy protocol with it or whatever. But as soon as they got to order to launch the missile, one of the first things the captain does is grab a handgun. Yeah. It was like, what is, maybe if somebody tried to stop him or whatever. I think that's what it is. Him. Yeah. They're trying to do every, every okay. basically it cannot be stopped. And all of a sudden Sox is like, guys, like I've, I've listened to a million of these launches before and something's not right about this. And they're like, well, what do you mean? He's like, it's light. And they're like, what? Someone has to confirm this. We're not going to look at him. He's a cloud of smoke is coming off of him. He yeah, reeks of weed. I can't see anything, man. No. They're just completely engulfed in smoke. And he's like, uh, the weed enhances my hearing. Ever heard of it? And they're like, oh, that's true. Okay. And then, uh, but uh, they're like, is, can anyone else? And someone, and the commander basically is like, well, yeah, I, I cut my teeth on the sonar. So yes, I can do it. So he puts it on. He's like, he's right. He's fucking right. Like it would be explained by the fact that there was no payload on this missile. And they're like, oh, shit, it's a trick. Someone is trying to trick us, and they're launching an empty missile so that we strike Russia and start a global war. Shit. Okay. So they run down. And they're like, okay, okay, president, like, this is going on, blah, blah, blah. They explain the whole thing. Okay. We got to stop. Kind of a funny scene here. Got to stop. Kind of yeah, they put scene. on hold. Yeah. <laughs> they're put yeah, on hold. They call like, the president, like, we have a very Im immediate thing. And somebody's like, can I put you on hold? He's like, no. And then you just hear hold music. Yeah. <laughs> cuts away and then finally they get back to him and so and even at this time they're like we can't avert the launch like there's a reason why like if if we avert the launch the entire military structure will go down and i always find these arguments kind of funny because in the end it's like well if you start a global nuclear war um guess what's not going to matter for shit the military structure because <laughs> the world will be gone so like maybe if you stop the global nuclear war that shouldn't be starting um you can re make a new uh, military order uh, the, for the one that crumbled because like I'm sorry like you have to stop this and so anyways they, they basically come to the conclusion that it can't be stopped the only thing they can do is actually stop the submarine so they have to find it and they have to destroy it and they are given orders to do just that and so basically they're like who can even find this the submarine's gone silent no one can find this and like uh, one man can his name is socks he's over there he picks his head up from yeah. just a desk full of cheetos and yeah. he's like um <laughs> yeah i'll get you sub for you let's fucking do it and so they go out in a helicopter they drop onto the titan uh and they're ba they basically explain the situation and omar Sai is like i worked for the captain forever like if we can find him we just have to we just have to talk to him he'll listen to us like like no you don't understand like nothing can stop this and uh, he's like no I think he'll I think he'll believe it. And so they go out, they're trying to find him and they know kind of generally where because through experience and stuff like that, they know there's a few spots that they would go. And they pinpoint the one they're doing and they kind of have to f they use socks to kind of f find that and they start to radio to him. And they're basically like 
you know, Captain, like, you got to stop the launch. It was a trick. Like, it was some terrorist group had, you know, taken the submarine, and now they are, um, you know, that they're trying to have us launch a nuclear missile. And everyone on the submarine, he's about to relent. He's like, I've, I've trusted this guy for my entire career. Like, there's no way he lied to me. And they're like, they must have been compromised. We saw that they got a, like, a helicopter came to that submarine. So, like, they're taken over by terrorists. They're trying to stop us, or the Russians. They're trying to stop us. Don't listen. And eventually he relents. Like, it's the military structure. He, he has to launch the missile. So he doesn't listen. And he's like, shit. He's like, okay. They're like, one more, one more chance. I'm going to go out out there myself. And so, he goes Dorsey out there. Does. Yeah, Dorsey's Dorsey, gonna yeah. go. Yeah, Omar say, and he he gets all up in a suit and he swims out there trying to stop them. And at this moment, the other people on the submarine are also like, we need to take them out. They are clearly trying to stop us. We need to be able to launch our missiles. We need to strike with at them out with uh, at them with a torpedo. And so as he's swimming out there, they shoot a torpedo and he dies. He basically, I don't know. It's it was a little weird. Like it seemed like he may have gotten disoriented, or basically it was that there was no chance that he had, was going to run out of oxygen, and like that was right, the end because he just kind of floated away. Torpedo he lost, came out of. Yeah, he lost the uh, the little submersible, whatever those are called. Right. That that was piloting him through the water. He got detached from that, so he had no way to to swim any other direction. And his uh, his um his his rig with the the the, the air got severed. So he was he was oh, okay. drowning. So it was it was kind of yeah. Just he a, he, a he bad even held situation. it up. He held it uh, he held it up, and you could see the bubbles streaming out of it. It got severed into two, so he had no air. Are you imp- are you implying that I didn't watch this movie close enough? Around? Yes, I, I say you probably took your glasses off after mm, the. That's uh, true. I was wearing them for too long. Was hurting my eyes. Yeah, that's right. And this, yeah, you probably yeah. your eyes were tired, and you must have missed that. And now, so, anyways, did he's you dead miss now. this also, Jamie? What's that? When he was swimming out there, so he was holding on to the people mover thing in one hand. You see what he had in his other hand? No. Did you see it, Brom? A wrench. He had a wrench. Yeah, I was, was going to guess that. <laughs> he was but... on his way to just bang right on oh, that that's hole, right. that yeah. thing. So, anyways, they're, on, now man. they're classic. <clears throat> now they're now they're like they have to do a bunch of evasive maneuvers, and uh, they. How do they? How do they stop the the first um, torpedo? Or do they launch a torpedo right in turn or something? The so, first torpedo is a glancing blow. That's right. Yeah, yeah, it's a glancing yes. blow, and they actually they get rocked quite a bit. And it's actually quite impressive because at this point, the so Dorsey's done, and the sub formidable is completely silent. So they're having a really hard time finding them. Mm-hmm. However, they activated the launch codes. So when that f- that hatch finally opens up and there's just like the quietest, just little noise, Stoner Man is all over it. He's like, I know where they're at. Right. And so they're able to to um, set a torpedo directly on their course as well. And basically they, they start to kind of move around because it's all on – they're all in like tethers or something, right? The, the torpedoes have like a cable attached yeah, to them while you're guiding. guiding them. So they can guide them like around and move it towards the submarine if the submarine tries to move. And they're like basically the only thing we can do is try to get the, them to sever that cord because then we could evade it pretty easily. And so they they set their own torpedo, basically mutual destruction. Either they move, sever their cord to get out of the way of our torpedo or – we basically both destroy. So it's a little bit of a game of chicken on whether they're going to be able to um, launch their nuclear missile or not. And so it's going, going, going. They're like, come on, come on, move. And they're like, no, he wants us to move because he wants to sever this cable. We can't do that. Like we have to see this through. And uh, basically they do. I mean, I th- both both submarines get hit by the uh, torpedoes. They're damaged heavily. Um, there's still a chance to launch the nuclear missile. Like it hasn't been totally derailed. Like there's still an opportunity at the very end of the captain could crawl his way over and launch the missile at the last moment. But basically very few, um, everyone's pretty much dead on Titan at that point, uh, other than the captain and Sox or the, the commander and Sox Admiral. and the Admiral. Yeah. They're, they're so they're, they're trying to get their way out. And at the last moment, Sox kind of picks up the phone and says, like, you've always trusted me. Just remember, like, I'm still haunted by the wolf's call. I feel like this is the end. I'm going to die. We're going to die. And I felt the same way then. That is a, that is my nightmare. And just just know that I'm not lying to, to you, that I hope this all turns out uh, how it should, be, and, and you shouldn't launch this. And it looks like 
the the captain of the formidable is about to like do the launch, but instead he pulls out the launch um like a circuit and stops it. And the admiral helps Sox get into like the escape tube, ejects him. Yeah, but and he, guess what, man? There's only one. There's and only one, says, yeah, look, only one possibility, yeah. He says, You got laid once, you got high. Yeah. Go live your best life. I'm going to die down here. And at the last moment, Sox is like, can you just leave me in here for a second? I want to hotbox this shit real quick. I've never had a nice space. And he's like, okay. So they let him hotbox the escape uh, tube for a second. Then they launch it out. You see the big smoke plume come into the water. And up he goes. <laughs> and he sits at the ocean. That's the end of, you know, everyone has died. Obviously, I mean, his girlfriend probably back home is like, oh, that guy boned once was on that submarine. What a crazy uh, happenstance a series of events there. Uh, but if she's relieved because she, maybe he was a little clingy, you know, afterwards. And also <laughs> he was real creepy because of how good he could hear. But now he yeah. like blew out his ears. One of the one of the things that happened was that because of the explosion and stuff like that, it really damaged his ears. It's the, like the end of his career. So we even see an, a, a scene at the very end where they're together, and he she had, she used to try to sneak up on him, but he could obviously hear her and know exactly where she was and stuff. And she tries to do it at one point, and he can't hear her anymore. He's I think, like, I think he ascended too fast from. Yeah, oh, that's right. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, he blew out his ears when he ascended. Yeah, it shows so his like ears his bleeding as he ascended up, yeah. and then and then everything goes quiet when he arrives at the surface. Yeah. So and now the here they could have they could have had it just be great if at the end when he's floating there and there's just vast expanse of ocean a shark comes up and eats. Yeah, just eat him. <laughs> but they they didn't go that route. I don't know why they went with you yeah. know. Oh well, he'll reunite him with his bookstore love. Well, uh, when we when we launch Mackie Studios uh, film productions, we can make a, a so movie like that. Every so every movie will end. Yeah, every movie will end with the main character looking off into the distance as some wild animal kills them. Mm -hmm. yes. No sequels. <laughs> no. The end. That's it, man. That's the Wolf's Call. Yeah. How was that in time? Did we even have a timer going? We did, but we weren't crazy over time yeah, i didn't think so, so. I think, I right like when we, we got to the point where we we're talking about pulling out the launch code i was like i won't beep him on this because we're almost done yeah so there we go yeah a return to form for I, sub movies I, I, for sure 100 percent a return to form for sure it's been a minute who wants to go first all right let me jump in here do it you said it to return to form back to the true submarine action that uh, we had, I'd say, earlier in our podcasting series where we had a rich plethora of uh, great classics to, to work through. Um, and we've been kind of uh, – what, what's, the, what's the, the figure of speech? We've been kind of uh, grasping Slack at straws, grasping uh. at straws there. Uh, the past few weeks, but uh, we got back to back to the, the real submarine action here. We had wrenches, we had fires on the sub, we had torpedoes crushing people, um, and That's ultimately, true. when did when did that? Oh, he got crushed by a torpedo, right? Because he right. had like a he had an issue where stupidest move. He's like, I'm gonna go. I forgot take about a nap, that. Yeah. And then he sleeps underneath a torpedo that's suspended above him. Has he ever even seen a, tor a submarine movie? Come on. Must not have. He had a so conflict of conscience. Happened. He didn't want to shoot and kill right. his friend Grand Champ. I forgot so about he that. Went, yeah. yeah. So he, uh, in his moment of crises, he had a panic attack and he went and laid down, but then ended up getting crushed underneath the torpedo tube or torpedo, rather. Uh, but you could tell just by me filling in these gaps here and throughout the, the recap there that uh, I was really engaged by this movie. Um, it started. At, with mo as most movies do, where I'm just kind of you know watching and hoping to you know that this is going to be a good film, and I knew nothing about this one, um, but it did. It, it reeled me in, and I was uh, I was compelled to keep my eyes eyeballs affixed to the screen. It had a unique plot line. I thought the uh, audio warfare mechanic uh, was was pretty unique to uh, anything that we had seen to this point. You know, obviously all of them hinge on you know finding submarines in the dark. Um, but this one really, you know, literally would fixate on Shantarad's face and, uh, he would sit there and you, you would kind of listen and hear what he hears and he would report his findings. And, um, it really hinged on that and his hearing, uh, even with, uh, his shore leave and espionage kind of endeavors and, and to, 
just fixated on trying to find uh, answers to the um, combatant that they had found in the initial scene in the film. Um, and he used that uh, to, to, to crack that code and everything and then illustrated it when he met the girl in the book sh- the bookstore owner, uh, how he always knew she- when she was sneaking up on him to, to you know, whatever, playfully, uh, whatever. Um, they, they did that twice, uh, so I thought it was really dark and sobering how he ended up losing his hearing in the end. Um you know, saving, potentially saving the world, um, and, uh, return to, to his girlfriend sneaking up on him. Uh, but she ultimately succeeds this time and grabs him on the shoulders and he turns around as he is a deaf man. Now, uh, it was a very dark, uh, movie in that regard. It reminded me a lot of ways throughout the movie of, uh, Das Boot, um, just with the, the various submarine action. I thought there were a lot of parallels to be drawn without being derivative of that. And then the sort of the dark, sobering conclusion to the film that we experienced in uh, Das Boot. Uh, this was a different different way to have a um, sort of somber ending. Uh, and that whole ethical dilemma, it, raised, it, it, it challenged conventions and raised questions. Uh, you know, what, what is our real responsibility? If, if there is a nuclear warhead in the air, um, you know, we always want to, pr- you know, present that we have the, the means to create mutually assured destruction. But when we're actually in that moment, it's, it's a really an ethical dilemma here um, that felt kind of realistic and challenged. You know, our conventions uh, as military, um, because now that it's in the air, we we found further information that showed that it wasn't the Russians that fired this missile. It was the uh, Persians or whatever I think they said that had stolen um, that's that Russian submarine. And and this was was their ploy. It was a terrorist organization, Al Jadida. Yeah. Um, And now there was no way to reverse course, and we were going to ultimately. Uh, send the world into nuclear conflict. So I I thought of it in a way, you know, which I've never thought of anything like this. And this movie made me think of it. And maybe this is just wait, uh, this is just silly to be (laughs) this emotionally impacted by it. But, you know, if, if the Russian government strapped uh, explosive vest to you in a warehouse and it, the timer's ticking down and they left you there to die and you found a way to escape. I mean, would you honestly run out into the street into a crowd of women and children to blow them up with you? Or would you huddle in a corner and welcome your death? Because, um, I mean, that's honestly what was happening here. Was it really appropriate to fire a nuclear warhead um into a major Russian city, you're going to kill far more civilians than you are going to hinder any Russian military operations. Uh, so it was, it made me think that, about that. And, and that's weird, as, as silly as it is to have a movie, especially like a contemporary Netflix movie to, to do that to you. But beyond that, you know, again, whatever, whatever questions arise there, you know, uh, I, I loved the colors in this. Nobody mentioned that, uh, but they yeah. they really did some stylized scenes where there was like some monotone and duotone colors of, of something that you would see like in a Apple commercial or something like that, where like the one sub was all red and their faces were green and the other one right. was blue and, and their faces were purple and it was all just duotone and psychedelic. It almost kind of functioned to reassert that this was taking place in the near future and they were, they were going to take some liberties with the story storytelling and the technology that was at play uh, just so you don't get too fixated on it being trying to be true to life and realistic. Um, So it didn't take itself too serious in that regard and had a real artsy flair to it without kind of being up its own butt. Um, Yeah. And the actual conflict again, that the, that the film ultimately presented was, it really felt realistic and challenging uh, I enjoyed it. I'm actually going to rate this as the second highest submarine film that I've watched, or rather tied with uh, number two. Uh, I'm going to give this a 8.5, rivaling my Hunt for Red October score. Nice. Wow, a very, very good score. Um, I'm I'm ready to jump in as well. All right, you jump in then. I'm going to jump, jump right in. in. So <clears throat> I had talked to Kyle about this. One of the things I had mentioned was I, I feel like this this – 
we may be tricked a little bit here just because I, I, I get the feeling that some of this stuff is pretty silly. Like I, as I mentioned as evidence, the shooting of the little lock off of the RPG and stuff like that. Yep, like, that was my I think least per- favorite scene. I think perhaps in France, this would have, this may be considered, oh, this is, an, this is like a, an action film. And, you know, it's not going to be necessarily regarded as high art or anything like that. I may be wrong. Maybe in France, they're like, no, we're talking about this is, you know, one of the top uh, French films of the year and, and is very well regarded. But I, I do wonder if in France, they're like, oh, well, that's kind of, that's more of like the um, popular schlock, not necessarily like the artsy one. Um, so I did, I get got the feeling a little bit, that there was a chance that some of something was being lost in translation a bit that we would have known that it was more like hunter killer, let's say, <laughs> than, uh, than something uh, major if we spoke the language. But, um, you know, otherwise I really, really enjoyed watching this. I thought it was very clever how they did a lot of the, uh, different twists on very common themes. Like you could see all the different pieces of submarine films, kind of the tropes that you, we see in these submarine films, the conflict with the uh, nuclear, uh, countdown and, uh, the use of different, the, the trickery being used. They've almost, they almost inverted a lot of that as well, where they took something that normally would have been the case, like, Oh, you know, there's a launch, quote unquote. Now it's not anyone tricking them; it's just some kind of test or some 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 mistake happened and gave it to them. Here, there's truly someone nefarious on the other side trying to start a war, and you have to do so. Like you have a, a little bit of twist of what we saw in Crimson Tide and stuff like that. And instead of having it be where the people on the submarine have to take the actions on their own, they actually do a little clever twist on saying, well, what would happen if now the people who were on land have to go and say, we actually have to stop them ourselves, go out there and destroy the submarine, uh, which makes it a little more palatable. Like if they had done that with Crimson Tide, you don't have the mutiny, which is kind of like the sticking point in a lot of this stuff. Here they acknowledge, no, it's the military. They're going to launch this missile. So what would they do? Perhaps they would send people out there to try to destroy the submarine. It's the only recourse is to kill the people on the submarine. And so <clears throat> I thought it was kind of clever how they, they did that and kind of remedied a lot of issues that people have with some of those other films. So I also agree. I really enjoyed watching this. I think it's a very fun movie. I think people would enjoy watching it who may not even be um, crazy people like us who watch a lot of submarine films uh, for reasons that are unknown. Uh, and so, yeah, I was going to come in somewhere very similar. And I think you convinced me. 8.5. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, two very formidable scores. They bring you guys back to Earth. One. <laughs> uh, you guys have said a lot here, and I do truly enjoy us getting back to one of these more traditional type submarine movies. You had the real feel in this of a modern sub movie. It was claustrophobic. It was tense. And one of the things that I also really liked, Brom, you touched on this, is sonar plays such, such mm. a major part in all these subs. And until now, we haven't really focused on it that much. I would say the only other time where it was really a focus was Hunt for Red October. Right. Because of the the new technology, the Caterpillar Drive, which was like a big right, deal the with the guy drive. trying to figure out what the Caterpillar Drive was from what he was hearing. It was also very much like a, a Mozart of sonar being like, I think that's a, a, a technology that we only have theoretically thought of. And that's what yes. it would sound like. Yeah. And a lot of, because most of the time, you know, we just see the captain commanding everything, da, da, da. But he does have a team working under him and you got to have reliable people. Somebody like Sox, who when he's not just smoking so much weed that it would kill a horse, you know, he can do his job. But you also bring up a very good point, Jamie. We do not speak French. We don't. Or do and we? So, and you said, I think it was at bowling night, you said, I don't know if maybe this is considered a bad movie over there. And that got in my head. But mm. at the same time, I really, really enjoyed this movie. And action was great. Went in a different direction than I thought it was going to. Yeah. Like we all thought. I was shocked. I was legitimately like shocked. Two second scene of him smoking weed and then that like completely changed the entire course of his career. Yeah. I mean, blew my mind. Him 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 being kicked off the submarine at that point, I was I was truly like, whoa, this this went in a direction I did not see coming. I know. Exactly. It 
you thought for the most part they were just going to be holed up and just going to kind of get these weird little reports about what's going on and eventually they're going to have to launch something but you didn't know what or maybe there was going to be sub on sub battle because the titan was going out specifically to protect the formidable but they didn't need him didn't need him at all so great movie i thought the acting from what i can tell you know, subtitles and all that. Because I did watch with subtitles. I tried for a second with the English overlay, and that was yeah. get that out of here. Could not handle. <clears throat> not it. good. Yeah. Modern filmmaking techniques, I think, are great. You get something here that's looking really good. I think you see stuff like that. And another movie that I really enjoyed, Black Sea. You get it. Just looks good. Feels tense. Feels like you're in there. And I'm going to match you guys, 8.5. Wow. I think it's us. I think it's a great movie. There you go. It's got to be one of our highest scoring ones. It is a very good movie. I think it's enjoyable. I would think, yeah, it's got to be. Something I wanted to mention in my review there. but failed to mention again, we did allude to it, was just some of the new technology, I think, that we saw. We talked about the helicopters dropping the, dropping the depth charges, but they also did at one point – bring helicopters in to, they said, make it like an ACDC concert so it would force Grand Champ to move to another hot point or whatever they call it and had the uh, the audio reverberating so that they weren't able to uh, navigate. So they had to move to a different location where the Titan was going to be waiting for them to, uh, to run some interference. So just some unique stuff that we hadn't seen on the, on the warfare side of things, which I, I know there's probably a few... Uh, fans of the podcast and fans of submarine warfare in general that we know of that would probably appreciate watching this just to see what some of the the different emerging technologies are. Yes. All right. Should I, a lot to- of cool I should I should also mention here too. This movie did make me think of something that Eric Marino has been on the show before mentioned and he talked about the importance of hiding the propeller when countries are showing showcasing subs and that type of stuff, how other countries will try to get a photo of that prop. And then this made me realize why with how good some of these sonar techs are, you're able to say, okay, how many blades does that have on there? What's the curvature of that? And you could be able to figure that out. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, something that, that didn't cool. necessarily resonate me with maybe a whole lot. When he said that, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Like why? And now you see, you see, you can completely figure out what is sitting in front of you just based on that sound. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, right, so worth the watch. Check it out on Netflix. I agree. Um, should I get into some trivia? Let's do it. I didn't find too much trivia for this guy. It's kind of a newer film. And uh, I think the only kind of notable thing that I, that I really found was a lot of articles kind of talking about how Netflix had to do something a little special in terms of buying it um, because they had to allow for a domestic release in France. They wanted to release to the theaters in France, and that's not really something Netflix does nowadays. They want to um, have buy the rights and release it on Netflix in all territories, and so they had to kind of relent. And so they gave re- uh, exclusive rights for 36 months to a domestic release in France and then uh, allowed it to kind of release everywhere else on Netflix after that. And that's kind of why this is a little bit of an older film, but was released in on Netflix uh, in 2019. Um, otherwise, I don't know, Kyle, are you doing a, a world subs worldwide? Of course I am. And then you have a countdown. Did anyone do Jeopardy? No, no one. Not so that instead, I know of. instead of doing, instead of doing some more trivia, since I couldn't find too much, how about we jump into a, into a little Jeopardy. If you want to do guys mm-hmm. want to do a challenge against each other. Okay, yeah, I haven't. Right. I haven't had the it. opportunity yet, but uh, so it's, I've wanted uh, we, to. <clears throat> we got two hundred, four hundred, six hundred, eight hundred, a thousand category. Category is hungry like the wolf. Ooh, Ooh. hungry like the wolf. Um, so, <clears throat> um, who wants to go first? What's up, Brom? Since you're new to this, you get to go first. Uh, all right, let's do hungry like the wolf for two hundred. In a classic children's story, he ends up in a pot of boiling water in the Three Little Pigs kitchen. Uh, who is the big bad wolf? That's right. Who is the big bad wolf? Why can't right. I see the answers for this one? Oh, there we go. Big bad wolf. Perfect. Um, all right, Kyle, what do you want to do? Let's go 400. All right. According to tradition, around 750 BC, the city was founded by twins mm. raised by a wolf. Can I Basic steal? history. No. Uh, Rome? 
gee, well, you, you gotta got wait for it because Kyle got it. All right, so Remus and Romulus. Exactly. We'll see. Okay, now you're showing off. You don't get any points for that. <laughs> uh, so what number do you want? Six hundred. Six hundred thousand. Really? Because uh, he's he's got the lead on you. He can put it out of reach. But okay, six hundred. I don't. His, I don't know what's. Uh, I don't know my Jeopardy strategy. Would you recommend I go eight hundred? I think you should go higher because he's got 200 oh, on man. I'll go 1,000. I'll go 1,000. I'll go 1,000. Okay. <laughs> okay, 1,000. I'm, I'm doing it. I'm allowing it. One of the you two know, varieties Alec. of gray wolf whose name begins with T. Uh, what is the timber wolf? Very good. See? <laughs> got to run higher. All right. So, Kyle. 800. 800. The Borzoi is another name for this national canine. The Borzoi? It's a national canine. National canine, which would be... Can I steal again? So this is a dog? Yes, it's another name for a dog. No, Kyle, that's wrong. <laughs> I don't more know. More clarification, more clarification. How about that one? Uh... Do you gonna I steal? I know. I know what my guess would be, but What's I don't. I don't want to lock this in and lose my money. I, I would guess a dingo. That's wrong. You didn't coyote. Like it. It's not a coyote. Come on, guys. Think of the, what is the category we're talking about? Hungry, Hungry like, like the, like the wolf. Wolf. Boy, boy. What was wolf? it? A bozo? Another name for a wolf? No, it's a another. Wolf. It's another name for a Russian wolfhound. Come on, wolfhound. Oh, a, hus- oh. a husky. No, a Russian wolfhound. Wolfhounds are these Just, giant I don't, ones. I don't know. Whatever. What is uh, it? Six hundred. What was uh, the answer? It was a, a Russian, was a wolf Russian wolfhound. Oh, well, well, I would never have gotten that. All right. See, well, I, actually, uh, I somehow knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you be uh, hungry like the wolf for six hundred? His nineteen oh four novel, The Sea Wolf, tells the story of Sea Captain Wolf Larsen and his ship, the Ghost. <laughs> I bought this book from my dad. My dad loves it. I have no idea who the author is. Well, don't know. It's a it's a good one. You don't know because it's it's listed as a triple stumper. No one knew it on Jeopardy. Kyle, you have any idea? The Sea Wolf, the book, nineteen oh four. So that's probably too early for Hemingway, right? Oh man. Well, yeah, I think you're probably right. I don't know. I have no idea. It's Jack. It's Jack London. Oh. So I got to say, I think I steered you correctly, Brom, because you came out victorious and only because you, you did not choose that one that you weren't able Wouldn't to get. And instead, you chose the one <laughs> that seemed actually really easy for yeah, being a thousand dollars. I was going to go to a thousand if you wouldn't have. And you would have okay. known Trimble Wolf, I assume, because you're a huge NBA fan, yeah. right? Big time. Big time. Of course. All right. I'm going to do one, a couple last things for my part. Uh, hold on. Uh, so I will do casting what ifs. Um, so, would you have liked to see Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer in this? Because they were he was they were the stars of the movie Wolf. Jack Nicholson and Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, is Michelle Pfeiffer our Chanteral? No, I, well, you could reverse it. Yeah, she could be the Chanteral, and Jack Nicholson could be the librarian that she falls in love with and totally bones. That could be cool. Yeah, I like that. What do you think? <laughs> Yay or nay? Sure, Kyle. whatever. Yeah, go for it. What about Benicio, Benicio del Toro from The Wolfman? Oh yeah, uh, we got strong connection. He'd to be that our movie. grand chant. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Yes, he'd be good at that. What about Leonardo DiCaprio, Wolf of Wall Street? Leo, Big time. Leo's are definitely our chanterad. <laughs> what about Michael J. Fox of Teen Wolf? Yes, mm, and yeah. that'd make him maybe, maybe, <laughs> I'd like to see Michael J. Fox being the Admiral. I don't know why. That's a good one. Just yeah, actually, I, I, I agree in there with that some odd role. He does kind of have that look, yeah. Yeah, what about Ed Harris? Now, he was in a film called Tween Wolf, which is a semi-sequel <laughs> to Teen Wolf, where he would play Johnny. He was a skateboard riding, bubblegum popping, rad as fuck tween from the wrong side of the tracks. He has to go to a rich school where he just doesn't fit in. But where when a werewolf bites him one night while he's peeping on a girl next door, his life is about to get a whole lot more complicated. That's because he has tried to explain to people how he got bit by a werewolf, but also he's trying to not let it make it clear that it happened while he was peeping on someone because that's like illegal and kind of creepy and he, should, he shouldn't he should have been doing that. And by the end of the film, you're kind of contemplating the tough questions like who's the bigger predator, the werewolf or Johnny, the peeping Tom? 
Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Sounds great. Yeah. I would like a new role added into the movie. Perhaps the jihadist send a video out. And that Harris. Everybody know. And you're just, <laughs> is that it, Harris? Oh my God. Uh, and then finish it up with a little uh, Phantom Zone. Engage the Phantom. Phantom's engaged, sir. And that's, uh, you know, so I had mentioned Omar Sy, actually a pretty prominent uh, actor. Just saw him in Call of the Wild. And he played the Exoturn Captain, and he was also in a bunch of stuff, including he was a voice in the Transformers series. And that includes Transformers Last Night, uh, which is the one that has most submarine in it. Actually, there's a submarine, a Transformer that is a submarine in it. Uh, and John Holland works in that. He's also in The Command, which is kind of cool since that's, you know, one of the 2019 films and one that's new enough that I actually have never used it in The Phantom, so I, a Phantom Zone. So I kind of like that. And so Max von Sydow is also in The Command, and he was also a Blofeld, Blofeld in Never Say Never Again, and that features Sean Connery, and then it's pretty easy from there through Hunt for Red October. And that's Phantom Dang. Zone. Good stuff. Yeah, no big deal. Don't worry about it. Ain't nothing but a thing. All right, it's time. It's, it's sub, 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 world, world, wide, wide. So, we had French submarines in this film, French film, and I decided I had only done one other French one, the really expensive Trompon, and I thought, oh, why don't we find out what is going on over in France? So, as of last year, July 12th, they launched a new submarine, the Barracuda class. There are other Barracuda class submarines from other nations, but this is the French Barracuda. Designed by Naval Group for France, these new nuclear attack submarines are going to be used to protect the boomers when they send out. So, very similar situation to what we saw in the movie. I thought, well, perfect. And there's an article called France Launches First Barracuda Class Attack Sub by Sebastian Springer from... July 12th, 2019, that day they were launched. And the company's, it says in there, the company's program manager, Vincent Martinau Lagarde, probably pronounced that very wrong, compared these boats acoustics to the sound of the ocean or the sound made by shrimp, which is crazy quiet, right? I don't think shrimp are mm -hmm. super loud. They got all those little hands grabbing on stuff but other than that not a whole <laughs> lot uh and this is made possible by using a pump jet propulsion system instead of a prop and which is kind of crazy if you think about it that thing's going to be so quiet and so you could have a boomer sitting out there and you don't if you come up on one you're not going to know how many are out there around you ready to strike six in total are supposed to be purchased by France. They are under contract. We're going to see how that goes because we've always seen we had this many planned, X number completed. So hopefully they get them all. They are also supposed to be used to protect large aircraft carrier. And according hmm. to the article, they are able to be out at sea for 70 days where the Rubus, which is what they're replacing, could only be out for 45 days. Well, but why not more? Why not? Why seven? Why not indefinitely? Yeah. I think it's got to do with food supplies. Why not 80 them? It's a good question. Maybe That's people question. start to lose their mind after a certain. certain oh, that'd be point. interesting. I'd like to know that. Yeah. That would be good. We could do a study. We'll see how long we can all last on one. I volunteer. That'll I'm be in the final episode. <laughs> uh, so the length for these things 326 feet, they have a beam of 29 feet. For speed, while they are surfaced, they can cruise along at 14 knots, submerged 25. They Not have bad. a crush depth of 1,150 feet. Now, who knows how accurate that is because you think France is just going to release all this information like based on their brand new sub? I'm not so sure. They have a nuclear reactor and two 13,000 horsepower electric engines. They hold 60 people. They have four 21-inch torpedo tubes. They can hold 20 torpedoes. They can house 
Sculp cruise missiles, which are launched through the torpedo tubes to hit targets on land. And in addition to protecting other boats, you know, the aircraft carriers and that type of stuff, they will also deliver forces to strategic locations like we saw the sub doing in the Wolf's Call. I think they even said they can be outfitted with a mini sub. And I was like, Hoo-hoo-hoo! let's see how that goes. And I'd mentioned that France was supposed to buy six of these. The total contract to build all of them is $9.9 billion. And these things should be in service until the 2060s, which sounds so weird to say. So is the 9.9, is that a round up? Or was it really uh, 9999999999999 cents? So that's a good question. I only keep it under, keep it you, wanna, you don't want to get it up to $10 billion, Otherwise, no one's going to buy that. They spent know, every, right? yeah. every penny they could to keep it under yes. $10 million, though. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny. I was actually reading some article on it, and the one of the bigwigs in France was asked a question. So we said, well, what if they go over on contract? He said, that's not my problem. We have a contract for that amount <laughs> or something. He's like, that's up to them to hit that number. And another article from nationalinterest.org called Check Out France's Amazing New Barracuda-Class Submarine, written by Sebastian Roblin on November 4th, 2019. I don't know why both these authors have the name Sebastian. Maybe something is linked there. People with the name Sebastian love these subs. But he said that every crew member gets their own bed. So in a lot of them, you know, we've mm, seen that's right. They do the you rotations. Share a stuff. bunk, or you yeah. take shifts or something. So, little interesting. And that's it. That's what I've got on it. And every crew member gets their own beret and a bottle of wine and cheese, right? Oh, stereotypes. Wee. Yes. Yes. Crushed it. Yeah. All right. All right. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Let's count this down. Let's count it down, baby. Tube three, ready to fire, sir. Commence the countdown. Give it to me. So this week, uh, we watched a foreign language film. France's, I think this is their first endeavor into submarine films. Is that is that right? No, no, no. They've got one from the fifties. Which one's that? Called Casabianca. And right, I already... am having a heck of a time trying to find that one. Okay. We haven't talked about that earlier on the podcast, right? And I just wasn't listening. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, good. I, just wanna, I don't, I don't want to sound completely and utterly stupid there uh, or absent. Uh, but what we did watch a French language submarine film. And so this week, I'm going to count down our top five nations for making submarine movies. Nice. Number five, I'm gonna come in with. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Japan. Mm-hmm. All right. Ooh. Their their forays into submarine uh, filmography include Latitude Zero, Virus, Lorelei, which is Japan's answer to Das Boot, of course, as we remember from their movie poster, as well as the the various Godzilla films and and anime. Um, there is, this is one of those more of quantity versus quality though, I would say as latitude zero was our strongest, uh, scoring Japanese based, um, submarine film. Uh, that one we gave, um, a 6.25 average. What about, vi- what about virus? Got. What about virus? Virus scored a 5.81. Uh, okay. Really? It got that low. Hmm. I believe so. Provided your numbers are correct, Kyle, which... You know, oh, yeah. I only gave that a 525, <laughs> huh? I remember that being better, but... Jury is, jury is still on an Atragon. Yeah, we don't know. And shame on the rest of you for not rating Latitude Zero higher. Zach, I'm watching you with that five. <laughs> Regardless, Japan, number five. Number four, I'm going to give, with our newest entry here, France with the wow. Wolf's Call. And as you said, what was it, La Casa Bianca or something like that? Casa Bianca. We're going to have to check that one out. Make sure it doesn't drag France back out of the top five. But 
Uh, the Wolf's Call, I think, stands uh, strong enough on its own as a great entry uh, from our French brothers. Number three, I'm going to give it to Britain. Okay, I was going to say, is this foreign language or is this just foreign? Foreign, foreign, okay. foreign just nations, yeah. Uh, and and uh, it's really top five nations that we're, we're going to have America on this list. Spoiler alert. Uh, but number three, Great Britain. Uh, Black Sea was, I think, our strongest rated uh, British one. Uh, also had Silver Fleet, uh, 49th Parallel, and the Bedford Incident, which all also scored really great numbers. Um, 49th Parallel was? Uh, I think it scored really well with us. Well, I didn't know. I oh shoot! I guess I didn't realize it was an English film. I yeah, thought it was I'm, Canadian, but right. Oh, that you might be right with that. I could have swore it was British. Now that you say it, it no, might it have could been be. Canadian. Yeah, I mean, well, the the other thing is Canada and, and Great Britain, different times in history have sure. been connected stronger or less strong. Secret times, handshakes so. and yeah. hugging and <laughs> high fiving. Right. Sharing might, movies might be a misattribution there on 49th parallel. Regardless, I know the Silver Fleet is is one of my favorites. Black Sea is one of my favorites. Uh, Bedford Incident scored pretty well. I I, I think I you was a what? little conflicted on that one. But. It's definitely British 49th parallel because the actors there was like a bunch of actors who were the same as one of the other British films. So it's oh, almost okay. certainly British. But yes, it is set in Canada. And Obviously, isn't Ice Station Zebra British? Uh, I don't know that. I, I think know. so. Or Submarine so. X One is that's for sure, right? Yeah, there again a, a bunch of quantity, but there's also a lot of quality here as well. So congratulations to Great Britain. You're number three on our top can five I, can nations. I, can I guess what the top two are? Sure, because I think it's going to be. I think it could be controversial, the ordering you choose here. Because obviously, as I was coming into this countdown, I was like, oh, bro, obviously, America got to be number one. USA, USA, who, who, who. Uh, Rocky, uh, all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> but um, then I was thinking about it as you were kind of going through the rankings. And I think your ordering might be United States, then Germany. Germany to being number one. That's what I think might happen. All right. Prediction. Let's see how it plays out. Number two, the United States of America. Oh, all right. One down. Let's see how that prediction go. bears out. Our, our strongest uh, entry from America is arguably the hunt for Red October. Uh, with some honorable mentions like Destination Tokyo, K-19, The Widowmaker, and a slew of other Hollywood hits and classics. Again, we have quantity and quality here, uh, but the, the the stars and stripes of the United States coming in at number two. I don't think we're number one here because Jamie cranked it out of the park. We got to respect the godfather of submarine films with Germany and their entry of Das Boot. Mm-hmm. It only took yeah, one, no. and that was kind of their referendum on uh, submarine uh, action uh, on the, by the hands of the Nazis in World War II. And uh, again, it was just one of those really emotional films that that really makes you think and sticks with you long after you watch it. And uh, got to give it to got to give it to the the granddaddy of them all, Das Boot. Can I give a counterpoint? Sure. Counterpoint. Two words. Michael Dudikoff. <laughs> How about that one? Although the only thing That's with the Michael true. Dudikoff is that we very well might look at the films, the submarine films that Michael Dudikoff made, and they'd be like, oh, no, that's not an American film. That was a Romanian film. Then we'd have to make Romanian, Romania be the top submarine country. You know? <laughs> My word. Okay. Great. Uh, you raised some good points. Uh, we'll, we'll see if uh, any of our <laughs> listeners want to uh, sure. contradict us as well. Yeah. Let us know what you think. Speaking of. Speaking of, yeah. Listeners. Yes. We, for the first time in a while, have a letter from a listener. And now it's time for a letter from listeners like you. I got this email from someone who might be Nick Cage. I'll just say that. Might also be Harry Keetle. Could be. Harry Keetle is mentioned in this email. <laughs> it, could so, be my, it could be my brother, for all I know. We don't know. Nobody yeah. knows. So anyways, they said, 
I've been listening to Submersion for give or take 70 episodes. I happen around you guys around Dark Descent. Dark Descent is one of my favorite movies. Love that one. But anywho, I really love the new segment you guys did the last episode. And this was a few episodes ago because we had those micropods in there talking about the different topics of movies. Brought it up to some of their friends while out at a bar having drinks. And they gave each other thumbs up, thumbs down. And they just wanted to uh, share these movies with us, what they did. I thought it was pretty cool. And they did call out Zach for saying the Spider-Verse is not... Zach, the Spider-Verse is not part of Marvel. Sony independently animated and distributed it. It is a Marvel think character, I, though. It is a Marvel character. And I think I was the one who maybe said that that was in Marvel. So let's see here. So we'll go over these movies and we'll see what we think about it. All right. So we've got that, yeah. Kim. Kim Coppola which I'm pretty sure is Nick Cage, Timothy, Sylvia Stallone, Good. and Harry Keitel. So whoever you are, thank you for sending these in. So first movies we've got for hate. Kim says The Rock. Oh, why? I'm not going to hate insult any movie listeners. in the world. Why would you hate a at least serviceable movie? It's and a it's, good movie. Also, it's a good movie. We're, we're not even just talking about Nick Cage. We're talking about Ed Harris himself. We are. We are. You are face. insulting Ed Harris. All right. But don't worry. Thank you for writing in. All right. Timothy. Yeah, we love you. Movie, movie Timothy hates. Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom. Oh, interesting. I, I can understand that. At least. Yeah. Sylvia I'm gonna, Stallone. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thumbs down that answer. Yeah, no, I can. I, I, I also would disagree with it, but I can understand that. Okay. Because it's, it's kind so of a silly we, one. Let's let's cut it back to thumbs up, thumbs down, as we uh, had to do. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah. And the yeah, it'll take actual, forever if yeah. we don't. Yeah. Sylvia Stallone, hate, die another day. Thumbs up. Sure. Harry Keitel, hate, Shawshank Redemption. Thumbs down. Uh, what the hell? Yeah. Thumbs down. All right, overrated. Here's overrated movies. Kim, face off. Thumbs down. Thumbs down. Come on. Brown, have you never seen face off? I've seen it. I I want to thumbs up the comment. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. (laughs) All right. uh, Timothy says Amadeus. Oh, interesting. That's an interesting answer. I'll, I'll give an interesting. I'm not going to give a thumbs up, thumbs down, but it's oh, you're going to go like the half sideways, like Joaquin Phoenix does yeah. in Gladiator. No, I think I think I can see why someone might say that. I'm not going to say thumbs it, up, thumbs down, or Joaquin right. Phoenix. Joaquin yeah. Phoenix. Gotcha. I Joaquin Phoenix. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, Sylvia Stallone says Southpaw is overrated. Haven't I've never seen, seen it. it. Yeah. Keep going. Jake Gyllenhaal is shredded in it. Harry Keitel shredded like lettuce. Yes. Harry Keitel says Joker is overrated. Oh, thumbs down. I think other people on this podcast would say thumbs up. Alex said thumbs yes. down, on, or uh, agreed with that one, rather. And, uh, all right, on to the love section. Kim says they love Con Air. Thumbs oh, up. thumbs up. Yeah, come on. Thumbs up. That's a fun one. Yeah. Timothy loves North by Northwest. And thumbs up. It. It's classic. Sylvia Stallone loves Die Hard. Oh, yeah. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. And Harry Keitel loves Interstellar slash Goonies. Sure. Both both thumbs up. The one thing I will mention for the person who liked uh, Con Air, if you want to watch a cheap knockoff bad version of that, check out Turbulence starring Ray Liotta. Just watched it for BadMovieTwins.com. That's BadMovieTwins.com. All right. These are the movies to watch over and over. Kim says Moonstruck. (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) I only watched that for the first time not that long ago. Weird movie. Sure. Timothy says 2001 A Space Odyssey. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Sylvia Stallone says Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Oh, interesting. The Volume 2. I would have thought the first one. So I'm going to give a middle one. I'm going to go thumbs down. Yeah. I haven't seen either of them, so I don't know. Uh, Harry Keitel says Kung Fu Panda and Lord of the Rings. Thumbs up. Thumbs up on Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I've never seen Kung Fu Panda. Me neither, actually. Thumbs up on Lord of the Rings. (laughs) A uh, movie that changed your life. Kim says Ghost Rider. Thumbs up. 
sure. All right, Kim is all Nick Cage all the time. I, <laughs> yes, I see, I see yes. the theme. All those, all of them are Nick Cage movies. <laughs> uh, Timothy says, "Gone with the Wind." Oh, it's a good movie. Long movie. Good movie though. Very long movie. Oh, sorry, I skipped over one. I'll have to go back. Uh, Sylvia Stallone says, "Black Hawk Down." Great Thumbs movie. Up. Thumbs up. And Harry Keitel says Schindler's List. Thumbs up. Yes. Yes. That was my answer for that one as well. Ah. Now, what's the movie that made you fall in love with movies? Kim says Raising Arizona. Okay. <laughs> that is, as, if you're going to name a Nick Cage movie for like, like a culturally you know, if you want, yeah. relevant, yeah, relevant uh, Nick Cage film, that's the one, I think. Thumbs up. Timothy says anything by Wes Anderson. Sure. I like Wes Anderson. Sylvia <laughs> Stallone says Rocky. Yeah. Harry Keitel says Godfather, Casablanca, stories we tell. Haven't seen I those. mean, you haven't seen Casablanca? Nope. Ah, uh, it's amazing. Godfather's amazing too. So check yep. out. That was on my movie I need to see list. Movie that surprised you, Kim says National Treasure. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually kind of agree <laughs> with that. That's yeah, crazy. That you. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, Timothy says Lost in Translation. Sure. Still, Sylvia says Taken, which that oh, surprised wait, yeah. me. Thumbs yeah. up. Harry Keitel says Booksmart and Usual Suspects. Guilty Pleasure Movies, Kim. Big Guilty Pleasure Movie right here. Wicker Man. Thumbs up. <laughs> Timothy and Glorious Bastards, Sylvia, like Expendables. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good guilty Harry, pleasure one because it's not very yes. good, but it's also fun to watch. Harry Keitel, Ocean's Eleven. Some of those are Kim, just good movies, though. That's the only thing. They are. Yeah. Kim for Tearjerker, Leaving Las Vegas. Uh, Obviously, yeah, Tearjerker. That is really depressing. Timothy, Up. That's a good one. Sylvia Stallone, Million Dollar Baby, and Man on Fire. And Harry Keitel says Logan. I've actually never seen Logan. I weird? like Logan a lot. It's a good one. I saw that one in theaters, and I haven't seen many of the other, you know, superhero movies, so I wasn't sure. Exactly. Yeah, I've kind of, I kind of fell behind on some of the superhero ones, so I never got got around to Logan. It's one you can yeah. watch in a vacuum. It's really good. And finally, here movie that you should have seen but haven't, Kim. Lord of the Rings, that's mm. probably because you were supposed to be in it, but you weren't cast in it, so or you turned it down. I can't I can't fully remember right now. Right. Timothy, there will be blood. Sylvia, John Wick, go watch that movie. It's amazing. I've also mm -hmm. never seen John Wick. All right, Jamie. It's a good one. We're gonna have a three day watch party. Or We'll watch all of them in one day, I mean. <laughs> and Harry Keitel, Citizen Kane and Pulp Fiction. Classic Keitel. Hasn't seen a movie he's been in. Can't can't believe it. Yeah. Well, that was fun. Keep that sending was. them. Keep sending out those questions. Or and some more of those. Here. It's fun. Yeah, just keep on doing that, and we'll keep on saying, uh, <laughs> disagreeing with you and saying that they're dumb choices <laughs> or something. I don't know. I think we agree with a lot of them, though. Yeah, I would have said Yeah. So. Yes. All right. All right. That's all I got. See you next week. Thank you for listening to Submersion. Don't forget to subscribe for new episodes every Thursday. If you like what you heard, please leave us a rating wherever you listen. Want to interact with us? Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We also love to get messages from all of you. If you have a suggestion, a comment, or just anything you'd like to share, please email us at maceaststudios at gmail.com. 